So the swap meet is coming next weekend. It is Tuesday night. Yes, Tuesday night. So I am going to put some engines together. Big block, big block, big block, big block. That one with the yellow box on top is 468. I am going to bring it down and finish it. So here it is, this block was all done, prepped, worked. I put it together a couple of months ago, maybe. It is 468, it's got Hyper Eutectics. It is about 11 to one with aluminum head, should run on pump gas, pretty easy. I've got a solid roller cam, which is pretty aggressive. I might tune it down or say to hell with it. I'm gonna put on Edelbrock heads, rectangular ports, and single plane. And it should be a fairly stout little motor. It's got um, GM thumb rods, it's a four bolt main. It has got a steel crank. It is a pretty nice stout motor and I'm guessing it should be well into the 500 horsepower. So I have a bunch of engine stands, so whatever motor I'm working on, I just leave the, the, the this, yeah, the this on. And then I grab an engine stand when needed, like this one, slam it on. Now I'm ready and my wooden box should release there now i'm ready to assemble i might go up there and get some parts but i'll flip this on the stand and have a look at everything first try and refresh some memories so up here i have the intakes um i got a dual plane a single plane for a big block but since these are the Edelbrocks I'm going to be using, they are, I believe, a rectangle port. <laughs> yes, they are. So I'll be using the Brodick single plane, which will be make it a higher RPM motor. So I will be using probably that solid roller camshaft, and it'll turn into something a little crazy um here are the valve covers i can use oil pans are up here and there should be a windage tray in some of them which i like to use uh rocker arms we should have enough over in this area push rods there i am going to start building There's the stuff from upstairs, heads, lifters, intake, uh, valve covers. We'll be measuring push rods and stuff in a bit. And then we'll see what we can do. Hello. So I got down the old 468 from upstairs yesterday. I built this short block, long block, I should say, a little while ago. It consists of a gen 5 which means it is a single seal crank which is better for leaking it's a four bolt main block its casting number is right there so these were in 90s uh mainly half tons they were in they're a good block I like them because they're not prone to leaking and they're fairly fresh to find them. Old 454s are tough to find. Uh, this one comes standard with a four bolt main, which I'll oh, see if you can see it right there. 
So Pistons, I'm using 11 and a half to one Keith Blacks, a hyper eutectic piston. Um, cylinder head is a Performer RPM 6055, which is a rectangle port. They flow really good numbers. They can produce anywhere from 525 to 650 horse. I think they'll go beyond 650 with the right build. Uh, they're more than big enough for what I want to do with this motor. Uh, I'm going to sell it, so I can't really say what I want to do. That's the trickiest part about building motors to sell. It's like painting a car. Uh, I would have loved it if it was red. And meanwhile, you painted it blue. Well, had you painted it red, a blue guy would have come along and so on and so forth. But I plan this motor to be in the mid 500s, but a very good living long motor. So I use a GM thumb rod for a connecting rod. What is a thumb rod? A thumb rod comes standard in the truck blocks, the tall decks. 427s and 366s, which most people consider junk, and I think they're treasure. Uh, the thumb rod is quite a bit stronger. They would probably compare to, remember when GM made the pink rod? It was a strong forged rod. The thumb rod is a lot like it. I'll show you some differences in a little bit. The other good thing about the Mark V is they come standard with a plate to hold the cam from moving, which is awesome. But I always ordered the Gen 5 camshafts to put in the older ones because the older ones have the plate accessory and you can just put the plate on the old ones. And you don't have to play with a cam button and all that other horse shit. I also like to always use a degreed um, sprocket for the crank so I can degree the camshaft. This one, I said it exactly. It is pretty much bang on with the spec comps wanted and I wanted it straight up. So I put it in straight up. It's about maybe... 0.7 degree off of where it should be. Um, the next motor build will go through how to degree camshaft. So this one is a hydraulic roller uh, camshaft. It is uh, a wide angle. It's 114. Uh, why did I choose that? Is because it's got huge heads. Uh, It'll actually kill a little bit of compression, so it's going to be very street-mannered. It should torque the bottom up quite a bit. And I, like I said, I don't want to scream this thing. It is about a 570 and a 590 lift. Uh, duration is about 580, or sorry, 280, 286. I'm just going by memory, but you know what? I'll look up the spec and give it to you for sure. So it shouldn't be a super wild, crazy idle. It should be a very nice, treatable motor. What's going to be nice for using the, the 114 is if a guy wants to fuel inject it, it is perfect. What it does is it minimizes the overlap compared to another camshaft which you need to fill the piston chambers. But because I'm using such a big head for this build, like it's not super big, but it's more than big enough for this guy. It is not gonna need a pile of overlap and give up time or give up my idle and street ability to try and fill the head to gain a little bit at the top. I rather use a big spread lobe and go with this. I think it should make for a super nice running motor. Uh, I've got a high volume oil pump on it. I always use high vo uh, volume oil pumps. Yes, they take a bit of power, but you know what? A rule of thumb 
a guy should always look at is you need 10 pounds for a thousand RPMs. So if you run a little small block or a big block to six, seven grand, you need 70 pounds. Your average oil pump is not going to do that. So I don't mind putting too much oil and sacrificing a bit of power. You can pick up free power all over the place, which we can discuss in later builds also. Uh, I am going to start buttoning this up. I'm using a Brodix single plane intake with the small carb flange. I plan to run an 850 or a 950 on it. Uh, Folks, believe too big a carburetor, too big a carburetor. I have never had bad luck with bigger carbs. Just spend the time jetting it and working with it. Uh, yes, they'll give up a wee bit at the bottom, but you know who is going to run the thing at 1,500, whatever, even driving down the highway, it'll be... 21 if it has an overdrive it'll be 26 27 if it's a three speed so chances are that's where it's gonna live so i like the bigger carb i rather give it what it needs at the top than sacrifice it you know with the smaller carb and starving at the top uh i'll start putting it together now and I will show you a quick video of the thumb rod versus the big block Chevy rod, the normal street car automotive passenger rod, I guess we could call it. And then I'll get busy. As I told you I would do, here is a truck block. This was a 427 piston, you can tell it's Got four rings. They use three top rings. One, two, three. Yes, that was pretty damn good counting. Um, the rod is the exact same length. Uh, this is a 454 piston, which is shares the exact same bores, a 427. They just changed the stroke from, I believe it's 376 to 4. So the 427 has the shorter stroke, which... I like because you can turn them into potential die grinders. So, being that they got four rings, you can see the piston is a half inch taller, which is the exact difference in the block height. That's why they call them a long block. I'm sure you've heard of the term. The 572s, I believe, are long blocks also. Now... The downfall with these is those pistons weigh 673 pounds. They use the same ones in the Titanic, so it was a very slow turning motor. These, on a good day, they were governed all at 3,500 RPMs, unless it was downhill to some bitch might have seen 4,500 once in the blue moon. But other than that, they didn't really see stress. Now, this is the thumb rod. Why is it called the thumb rod? It's really stupid, but I'm going to show you. That is why it's called the thumb rod. That is like a dog bone rod. I don't know what the hell they call it. But anyway, I'm going to show you the difference. I can't give you the exact because Vernie, my caliper, the Vernier, Vernie, I call him, it's got a dead battery. So I'll show you the top there. Won't go on, meaning he's thicker. Let's check just before the dog bone. Not even close. So the depth also, if you turn them sideways, You can physically see the forging mark. It's a lot more pronounced. It is a heavy, heavy rod. Now, let's do this. See, it's quite a difference, as you can tell. 
So the rod end, it's hard to believe to see with the naked eye, but once you get measuring, you'll find a difference in thickness from there to here. This one is bigger all around. It is just, I don't know, the best thing since cinnamon crunchy cereal. Yeah, because that's what I like. But yes, this rod, it's free. So all you guys that mock the truck block, you shouldn't because even the 366 has these rods and they come with a forged crank, which is a 427 crank. The 366 just has a dinky little bore that's no good for nothing. So the block is undesirable. Yes, it's a boat anchor, it's garbage. Make a mailbox, a barbecue, whatever the hell you want, a eight beer holder. But take the crank and take the rods because they are amazing. I have never, ever, ever broke one. Uh, and I have taken these things up to 65, 7,000 and race only. That's all I did. So they are about, oh, don't quote me, but we'll show it on the build I'll do for Tony. I think they are about, oh, 10 grams, maybe more on weight, not even that much than this guy. But chicken bone steak that's what you got to remember so thumb anyway i hope you were bored to death with that moving on small thing i'm going to mention about installing a head on the chevy and it's not only a chevy there's quite a few uh installing the head bolts now there is what they call blind holes and open holes. A Chevy is always open, meaning there is no bottom. So what happens is these thread holes go straight into antifreeze jackets. So you want to make damn good and sure that these are clean. So I chase them with a tap always and then use a Teflon sealant, a liquid sealant, to uh, seal the threads. Because antifreeze can push past the threads, up the bolt, leak in through the head, past these guys, and you'll get antifreeze in the motor. So it's just take your time, clean those holes. Um, the Chevy is a 7 16 coarse thread uh, that's even shared with the small block it's also 716 thread national course that's what the nc stands for so here we have it here if you're not familiar with what you have every tap and die kit has one of these and it's not a miniature hacksaw it is actually, you lay them in the bolt threads and it'll tell you what it is for pitch. So on these, it'll say the pitch. So this one is 014. So meaning, no, four, 14, sorry. So that means 14 threads per inch is what that stands for. Because the block was at the machinist, they take out the dowels. Now, you know what? I usually stock these. They cost nothing, a couple bucks a piece. I put new ones in each because a lot of times these things are so beat up from people putting on heads with uh, front and loaders and D7 cats and whatever the hell they use. I don't know, but I've seen them pretty beat up and ugly. So I just put a new one in so I know it's a tight fit and my head is not going to walk on the bores. Like... Believe it or not, without a dowel, they'll actually walk. And before you know it, you blow a head gasket. The other thing is this one didn't need decking. Now, I just simply check it with this. 
It's a beautiful match all the way. All the way up the bore. Now, if you're uncertain with this, before you assemble the motor and decide whether it needs it or not, and don't let the machinist talk you into spending another $10 million if you don't have to. I put grease on the surface after you clean it. Grab a good level, like this one that you didn't use to hammer nails in with or as a small pry bar or a wedge to shim something up, but it's actually a good squirt. Set it across like this, put a hand on each end, wipe it up and see if it smears all the grease off the, de off the deck. If it does, you're in good shape. If it doesn't, you'll see the low spots. That's when you know you need machining, if you're not sure. Well, I should have showed you. Um, this is how I install them. So I just make sure the bolt is in a good half inch. Then I hold the top and tighten the nut down, which will in turn push the dowel bushing into place, as you can see like this. You'll feel it snug. This way you push it nice and even, and you avoid beating the piss out of it with the hammer, as much fun as it is. I'm gonna talk about the head a little bit. Um, we'll get into porting and polishing and whatever in a different episode. I am gonna show you. If I get Fernie to cooperate, there it goes. If you are running a true 11-ish and 11 and a half, you can get away with almost 12. On pump gas, detonation is your worst enemy. What you don't want is, if you can see, this sharp little edge. Mainly that point is the worst. Any sharp object, you want to blend them out. What happens is these will heat up and they'll actually detonate. They'll get hot enough to detonate a charge, which will cause backfiring and weird shit and bad stuff. So if I was to run that high, I would blend all these little lines out. This one too. You'll see it. And you know, if you look careful, they're not all the same. So it doesn't matter out of the shelf or off the shelf you buy it. They're not all perfect. This edge, I would also chamfer it a little bit. Not a lot, just take the very sharp edge off and just kind of like blend it a wee little bit round. Like I said, only if your compression is up super high and you're worried about pump gas and whatever else. Now, another important feature is um, the port matching, which you've heard of which is these in relation to the head. Okay, that's gonna seem kind of boring to the guy that doesn't really give a shit, but I'm gonna do it, tell you anyways. So I laid the gasket in place. You can see it is not quite port matched to the gasket, but these holes in the gasket are half inch. These are three eighths and they're on an angle because it's a big block. So. You can lay your gasket and them near match it, whichever line you want. So where do you place the gasket? Well, when you assemble the gasket, this guy of the gasket is gonna lay on the block. So it'll be flush with the bottom of the head, same as this side. So I set that flush like so, set him flush like that center it on a bolt hole with the naked eye the best you can now i put a bolt in now before i put a bolt in with the washer and gently snug the gasket just to hold it in place 
I'm going to grab my friend Vernie again and measure the hole. It looks like there's lots of depth for this little guy, but then I go to this side and it's short. So I'll have to use a small bolt, but I prefer to use a bolt and a nut. Last thing you want to do is try and thread it in and crack something and, oh, it'd be madder than a fat kid in a vegan store if you cracked it. So, what I'm going to do now is snug it down. But before I go ahead and do that, you guys have all seen a little oil puddle on the top of the intake. And you think that it's your valve cover leaking. Stupid valve cover, cheap pieces of shit, blah, blah, blah. Not the case. This is also an open hole. Do you see it? Intake one. This one is blind. This one is blind. This one into the oil. This one blind, blind. So what does this mean? So now these aren't torqued near as tight as a head bolt. These are like 35, 40 foot pounds. But now oil and crankcase pressure can mist up the threads, go past the bolt head and make a puddle on top of the intake. So there again, thread sealant, thread sealant, but you know what? thread seal them all who cares unless you know you're short on thread sealant I've gone ahead and snug them down as you can see this is flush that one's flush so i tighten them a little bit just to hold the gasket down nice and tight it's tighter than a dutchman's wallet right about now same as this side now why is that important because we're going to mark these holes with the scribe. I got to go get one. I have my scribe. So I am going to scribe these edges. It'll make a mark. I'm just practicing because I got to use both hands because I'm that guy. But just to show you. If the intake is bigger than the head, it is definitely, definitely gonna hurt you. The intake is smaller than the head, it'll be okay because air comes in like this. Now it hits that side dead wall, it doesn't know what to do, bounce off to the side, holds up all its other friends, the air, and they have a little fight and I want in, no, you want in, no, I want this way. So why do you want that? So just make it smooth. But if you don't want to do this shit and the intake is smaller, you're fine. If the intake is bigger, don't do it. You know why? This, doing this, takes a bit of time. But you know what? You're going to run your high volume oil pump for free. You're so worried about that little extra power the high volume pump took. You'll gain it back by doing this and it's free. So now you have the best of both worlds. Okay, so I took the gasket off and you could see the scribe line. If you look good, maybe I'll angle, you can kind of see it shine there. So I drew them in with green. Now it doesn't look like a big difference, right? But you know what? Because I am such an educated bump, I'm gonna do the math for you guys. So I would roughly say that's an eighth inch mainly on two sides but anyways i measured with verney this board size and the gasket size so the gasket was two and a half by inch and three quarters um the head was two and three eighths by inch and five eighths so i had to convert that to a decimal point which caused a lot of sweat tears and head scratching but i did it so, to get the square inches times this by that, you get 4.375. Do this side, same thing, 3.85. That is a different, folks, of half a square inch per hole times eight cylinders 
is 4.2 square inches we gained. Do you now believe that this would probably gain a bit of power, making flow bigger, better, faster, smoother? I would think so. Now we'll do the intake. Turns out the Brodix intake is smaller, so it wouldn't have hurt a lot, but why not match it? And we gain all our flow. So, having said that, the antifreeze sports don't really matter. See how small and tiny this one is? To that one, this is not even a crossover. Because this is where the distributor is. This one's the front, it's the crossover. But it's not a big deal. But you can do them, but it just makes no sense. Why would you hog out 17 yards of aluminum for nothing? This one, I would definitely do. Now, a lot of people say it's not worth their time and effort to do it. I kind of, uh, well, I kind of compare it to the 380 pound race guy in his little left body Mustang. He's taking the ashtray out, the cigarette lighter, the dash panel, everything, but refuses to go on a freaking diet. So it's the same way with me. I want to keep my fat oil pump. So I'm going to find other ways to make up for my fat oil pump eating up horsepower. This is one of them, just one. There's about 17 others we'll show you along the way. I always use spray gasket high temp copper coat, I call it, on my head gaskets. That used to be blue in it. It is now copper. Now this is kind of a tacky sealant. It's the same as high tack that you guys are maybe familiar with. Now there's 20,000 arguments that People should put them on dry. I like the wee bit of insurance. I haven't had it steer me wrong. Plus, I'm stubborn because I'm Dutch. So, I'm not changing. I will always use copper coat. Live on. Installing the head. Even if you're going to use studs, do not put all the studs in first. You're just setting yourself up for a little bit of a disaster. It's not a disaster. Again, people agree and disagree. I like putting them in very loose. In the short guys, use long ones. Now when I grab the head and lift it into place, I just simply line it up with these two dots. Are these two studs? Wow, can't even talk. Lower it down, it falls in perfectly. I don't have to wiggle it around. So it shifts on the gasket to find my brand new tight dowels. So this is what I do now. I don't recommend putting all the studs in and putting them tight because these, feel them, they're sharp. If you're using an aluminum head, you're gonna shove the head on and it's gonna file. Those little slotted, like the holes where they slide in the head, filings fall, filings trap around the bolt holes. Some get stuck inside. Aluminum filings in the motors don't hurt that much. It's not great for them, but they sure hurt when they're laying on the gasket. And now creating your shitty pressure here or around the stud, lifting the whole thing, causing maybe a head gasket issue in the future. So my question is, why? So I like doing it like this. I'm gonna grab the head, install it, show you how easy it goes, but you know what? Because it's on video, it'll backfire, sure as hell. I can't believe that worked. <laughs> I'm editing the video and I realized that some stuff was left out. I'm sorry, my cat looks psycho. Um, Valve lash procedure, all that stuff was missing and you just seen it at the swap meet as a complete engine. We're aware, we'll cover it in the next video or something. I just do not have, he doesn't have the time to sit down and talk about it for this week's video. So it'll be in next week's, probably I'll put it in the beginning or something. We have to reset the hot lash anyway and the carburetor and timing 
on the engine afterwards. He will also talk about it. You'll see it at the end more so. But that'll also be discussed later. Probably next week's video. I'll, once again, put it in the beginning. And um, while I have you, since I don't want to record this again, uh, we have been working on a 6NZ cat engine. We've recorded the whole process as a complete rebuild. Everything was done to it. If you're interested in seeing that, let us know because we don't know what kind of content you guys want to see. So, anyway, get back to it. Ah, Sunday morning. Beautiful day. It's the morning after the swap meet. I'm just gonna head to the shop and unload treasures. I'll show you the horses. I think they're there. Let me zoom in. Can't do it. It's a little, little cow there too, four horses. Connor, the bigger cow, I don't know if you can see him. And there's Johnny with the combine tires. Here's Reno, he's a rare dinosaur horse. He's about 74,000 years old. Backyard towards the shop. Tell how beautiful it is. Oh, it's just a tiny weather. So, fail. Yeah, they should never see that before. So, here it is. Probably 10 to 12 feet, probably 12 feet or 13, maybe 13, 2 inches. Who the hell knows? But that's where I want to bring water into and then use that all as storage slash, um, I don't know, stuff. So then I can free up some shop space. So we'll continue the tour to the shop. So, yeah, someday we'll make something out of it. It's one of them things you gotta have. Below there is the cab for Winston, and there's Duke's body. So, we gotta get at him soon, but there's a lot of digging to get him out. Duke's frame is at the other shop, which I will show you one day. And we will rescue it out and then start on it soon. And return from the swap meet. Home came the 468. And that's the one I built, but it didn't sell. People figured I can build stuff cheaper. I don't know. Whatever, it doesn't much matter. I want to fire it up, fall in love with it, and keep it anyways. Those are some ink tags, heads, some old headers I had. Probably ditch bang three quarters of Alberta with them. Maybe a good chunk of Manitoba. I don't know, I don't remember. Um, some camshafts that I had. Now, these are purchases. Who's your daddy? Slicks. Um, some headers. And a aluminum rod for the 69. The headers fit Ursula in Duke because they're meant for a Corvette. They're special because They tuck right in because the Corvette has no transmission behind the motor, just the drive shaft. So that's going to be smurfix. 
I'm not even tired after unloading that stuff. Um, swap meet was okay. I'll show you what we got here. I'll have to turn the camera around, I think. Just a sec. So here's the motor that we took. It was a 468 we showed in the previous build. It was like the gigantic perfect boob in our uh, display. Everyone touched it, everyone rubbed it, everyone talked about it. So it was fondled unbelievably a lot. But you know what, it serves its purpose. I probably got two or three engine builds to do for other people because it's either too wild or too mild or oh, it's like asking the farmer for what the weather is. It's either too dry, too wet, too hot, too cold. It's always like that. You can't really build. You have to almost build spec. This was purchased, I told you before, the Corvette headers to fit Duke in the upcoming episode. There's a rad for the old 6.9er. Um, those slicks I need for Miles of Mayhem also on Duke for when we're at the track. I'll switch them on and then switch the street tires when we're not. Um, these intakes didn't sell. Uh, brand new aluminum heads didn't sell. Some hydraulic roller camshaft for big block Chevy didn't sell, doesn't matter. These didn't sell their Corvette rims and like I said, headers that, you know, have actually quite a memory with them, but whatever, even though they're Ford headers, which mainly is why they were ditch banged. Uh, those rims, I had $200 take all, no go, but I think I have probably $872,000 into moving them to 73,000 swap meets in the past couple of years. So I think I'm just gonna make wall art out of them or something or something. Cause I, those tires were new, but I wore them out by simply rolling them in and out of the trailer. Yeah, that's a lot. So I thought I was gonna do the smart thing and I bought a printer for the show. Like this is one of them, uh, you can hook your phone up to it and whatever. So I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna print the shit I got, make a list, people can look it up. That was great. So Friday night, we got the Red Deer Hotel. I think, I don't know, 11 o'clock maybe. So I thought I'll quickly try and hook this thing up and figure it out. I almost blew a head vessel trying to figure it out. Stayed up to one. Oh God, I am not a techie at all. This is why I like carburetors. So anyways, I did manage to print off one sheet. So it was pretty good. It's a win. And that was the build sheet for him. So now I get to put shit away. I'll do that and then we're going to flame up this 468 before we end the show and we'll call that a wrap till the next one. Why is it so much easier to load than is to unload shit? It takes forever. Oh, almost on last load. I'm going to jump in Guido, lift it up there, put it away, and then we'll sweep up, I guess, and then we'll put a big block on the stand and the stand's not done because I was doing mods on it back in 1941 when I was uh, 40. And uh, yeah, so we'll finish the stand, which is probably gonna take way longer than normal. But anyway, that's the plan. So we'll fire the sun bitch up before too long, hopefully. Let me jump in Guido and put the shit away. One more thing to clean up. This is the kidney donator big block. I bought this thing from a guy that blew it up. Didn't really blew up, it blew up on itself, not running over winter. It was in a boat. The guy never drained the water. Check this out. 
The power of Mother Nature is unbelievable. There's a gigantic split on the side too. Yeah, right there. Unbelievable. Looks like the frost plugs really did their job on this one. He must have Loctited them in. Like, I have no idea. I think this side is cracked too. Yep, it is now a bigger block. <laughs> but you know what? The thing's got a forged crank. It's a four bolt main. I bought it just for the internals because it was a boat anchor to somebody else. So to me, it was a win. It also had a factory roller in it. So I got the lifters, the keepers, all that shit. So made me happy, made him happy. So it's a win-win. I'm gonna put it away now. I had to borrow a kidney off of it at the last moment before the swap meet. I should have told you the, before, these are my $5 engine stands. Home Depot sells one by 10, believe it or not, which works perfect. Then I use a little piece of two by six in between. Then I cross brace it with a two by three, which is also the cheapest thing. But now I can get under it with my forks and the oil pan rails of each V8 sits on there. And as you can see, it doesn't much matter. They'll hold AMC, big block Ford, small Chevys, big Chevys. They'll probably hold whatever the hell you put on them, really. Well, they last is the big thing. The two are one by 10 split sometimes, so big deal. Whale a piece of shit on the side of it. But it's about the nicest way I can store a motor so far for the cheapest. One more cheapskate thing. These little chains. That was really blurry, it was meant to be. These are from Princess Auto. They're meant for uh, trailer hitch chains. They sell them once in a blue moon for like 10, 12 bucks. I buy them, they are the perfect engine chain and forklift chain. So, I store them here. Which serves as a couple of purposes. I can always find them. And if I'm hard on Guido's, those chains hit me in the head and remind me. Now, as you could tell, some mods were necessary. I'd never finished putting these on. I just always rigged it, whatever, but these are now adjustable, but I had to put, weld a washer on the back. I put in a fat bead on it because the pressure of these would just bend the washer. So now at least it's against the weld. So these are fully adjustable now this way or that way. So I got them in the bottom of the bell housing, which is good. These slide back and forth, do whatever. These go in and out. These hinge this way or that. This way or that. This way or, okay, I'll shut up. So I just put these two little bolts in. Now, this I made just to get access to everything first, so then you flip the rod up after and pin it. So that's what that's all about. So yeah, now I have to wire it and put a dashboard on. I used to have one, but it was so big and clumsy and shitty and ugly and stuff. So I just want something small. I don't really need a lot. I'm just gonna put three gauges on the temperature, oil pressure. And the third one is the Volt one, which you never ever use, but my God, it looks cool in the trio pack. So my idea is, which I won't finish today, but I will in the near future, is to grab a drain bung, 
Side the block, everyone has one. This is the lowest antifreeze point. Plummet to my little pump. And with the two-way valve to dump back in the tank or let the pump push fluid into here. So my plan is when it's done to drain the rad, you just crack this valve and it drains in. To fill it, you take the rad cap off, turn the pump on, it should fill all full of fluids. There's nothing worse than handling fluids. So that's the plan. So I'll put a Y in from each side because believe it or not, this doesn't drain well. You have to do both, so I'll do this one. And the opposite side, once again, another T with the valve going to the dump and one to the pressure side. So now I can fill or dump. So that takes care of that. This way the water always stays in this tank. There's more than enough. And the rad drains, everything should drain. Should be happy. What could possibly go wrong? Why the hell do I even say that? Because it's so fun. Um, so basically to run it, we just need a power wire to the distributor. Uh, one to the solenoid for start. Uh, battery box, which we don't have. That was going to be my fuel tank, but I'll just let it suck out of a jug for now. Because it's going to be close to 70% done. So there's no use finishing this thing. So the couple of hours that I thought I should have it running turned into what I thought it would be. Probably work a whole day in the engine stand and then a little bit. I had to work today, so I'm in here tonight. Um, but I figured instead of patching this stupid stand, I may as well finish it. So that meant putting in fuses and switches and shit to make life easier. And I wanted something that, you know, you can hook up quick. Like before it was fine, it worked great, stands awesome, but it would, it's messy. It's like you drain fluid everywhere and run wires for 37 days and piss around. So. Anyway, I made it a little easier. I'm still not quite done, but I'll uh, show you what the update is so far. So first I mounted the battery. And I don't know if you guys were remembering I was welding that shit on the back. I ended up turning them around so I could move the engine back further. So, and it turns out it's way easier because now you can get a full swing on the wrench. So speed is what it's all about. So I ended up putting drain valves on the side of the block, just one on each side. And I changed my mind with the pump. So the pump now sucks out of the tank. Not so much here or there, but right about here. <laughs> Then it discharges out of these two, which I made plates to go into the water pump jacket. So they blow water into there. I have one relief coming out, which goes to the bottom of the rad. Then the top of the rad comes back out and goes back in the tank. So, I turned the pump on, that should all work. Um, it primed itself, it was fairly awesome. Another neat thing you can do with it is, um, I'm actually going to put a restrictor valve in here at a later date, put a pressure gauge on here, so now I can run it up to 16 pounds and then block it off even. And now I can see if there's any antifreeze leaks, any shit anywhere before it goes in the car or bus or grain truck or whatever the hell this thing might end up in, don't know. So I got rid of the volt gauge because it's a waste of time, even though it's cool, but now it's like a, a duo gauge. 
instead of a trio gauge. So I just got temperature, oil pressure. Here's the fancy ignition for start. That's the start button. This one will do. Uh, this one does the fan, the water pump, and an auxiliary for a lot of stuff, you know, that differ from vehicle to vehicle you need. Like uh, some might, like say if I do a fuel injection one, I'll have to run a different pump, but I'm gonna get into that next because I don't use fuel pumps, period. And this, is a gen 5 there is no fuel pump boss so this one has to have help getting fuel in so what i got left i pretty much plumbed the motor uh so it should be ready to fire soon um i did use a screwdriver to bleed well, it's not a screwdriver. I'll show you what I used. This is an old distributor shaft. I welded a socket, which no one ever uses. This was like a, oh my God, there's, it's a standard version of trying to match a 15, whatever the hell that is in fraction. It's useless as tits on a board. So I donated it for this cause and this old, HEI shaft was no good for nothing. It was rusty. It's kind of scraped up. So, yeah. But having said that, I hate using the drill. It's a piece of shit. And I have a tank for this and I can't find it. So that's one dilemma. So I'm building a new one right now. I'll show you. The second dilemma is... My headers for the big block, I have a small block header set, a Dodge header set. I pretty much have a header set for all of them, like nothing special to run on this stand. Guess what? This dumbass sold at the swap meet, the big block headers. So now I don't have headers to run this thing. So today a buddy of mine gave me this old race set off of his um i think he runs a 73 camaro i'm not sure i think that's what it is and he bought a new set so these are now my dyno set so do not sell them do not sell them anyway moving on so this is my go to everything the one i can't find i must have lost it between moves i don't know but here it is so i got well this on here that'll be the fill and this will be this charge so now what happens i've put 10 30 in here or whatever the hell i want to put in that mule so now I hook the air hose to this, set my regulator to 50 pounds, tee this into the oil, in the oil port on the back of the engine, and I push all my oil in. So now I can comfortably watch it on the gauge build pressure. It's gonna push all the air out, it's gonna do everything. So when that's done, then you know there's no air it's got oil pressure and it hasn't even our oils everywhere it should never run dry one little bit so then to do it again you bleed off the air so now i can uh, clean it out so all i do is throw some brake clean or gas or whatever in there Rinse it out, which is why I use these bungs, because nothing hooks. It's the same level as the tank, so you can drain them good. So now, I will fill it full of gas, set my regulator down here at about 7 PSI, and now I have a fuel bowser without a pump, and I leave the air hose hooked up here. So... If I want to do fuel injection, I set it at 51 or whatever the hell the magic number is they want. 
So this thing, it's actually really universal because I hate tying pumps to shit. It's just a pain in the ass. So yeah, I'm gonna weld these bungs on now. Then we'll fill it full oil, push some oil in there, but it's done, but I'll show you how it hooks up anyway. I gotta put a dipstick in there yet. Um, then we'll fill it full of gas and flame some bitch up and see what it's got to say. Hee-haw! Well, our luck is holding. That header hits fairly hard. Not so much here or there or here, but right about here. Same place as the other one. It's very close, but you touch it. So, as you can tell, the flange is almost good, but not so much on this side. It's still got to go in. Now, I could probably tighten the shit out of it, and it'll flex somewhat. I don't know if I should try it. I guess it'd be crazy not to. Um... They're fairly flat, and I'm hoping to not have to screw up a set of header gasket to throw it away for the cause, just to uh, have it here, or, you know, just to hear it run for 10 minutes for breaking and setting. So I think I'm going to opt to just squeeze them nice and snug and see if they hold, but this side i have my doubts because it's pretty ugly i can't even get it to bolt up so <clears throat> i'm gonna scratch my head for a while um call the pope and see if he's got any advice for me and we'll go from there okay i'm not gonna lie i don't like the stance now but whatever it's on i'm just gonna have to find a different set of headers one day this will work for now this is my quick fix. Little jog. Thank God I had them tubes cut and I just use spacers just because you never know different things. So I just always use spacers. And then I just use the cheater little piece of flat to make it a little bit higher. So now it lifted it up. This one will close pretty damn tight. This one. Not bad, but I think it's gonna see shit our way. Well, it's flanged up. I had to force it a bit. I don't know if you've seen the video. I used a bit of heat and then gently banged it a bit. You'll see that's a massage. It is now custom for the Titanic stand. This side, pretty relaxed fit. I'm sure it's not gonna seal perfect because we got no gasket, which kind of sucks because it might make a flick, 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 flick. And it causes sometimes a wee bit of a little backfire when you let off throttle, but we'll find out it's good enough. Like I said, I don't really feel like sacrificing a set of header bolts for this job. Um, I noticed I had a drip out of my flange so I'm gonna pull them off quick and then change the uh, the gaskets. There is no gaskets. I just used a hair of silicone, figured that would do it. But I'll put a pair of gaskets in. I got these grommets to contend with. So I'll put the old PVC on this one and the three eighths line the back of the car, run a vacuum advance to this sweetheart and we'll see what happens. A little while ago, I seen this funnel at, I don't know where the hell it was, and I thought, that's the weirdest shape I've ever seen. What the hell would you use that for? But I had to have it because I knew if I don't get it, I'm going to be sorry I seen it, and now I need it. Guess what? Watch this. See that? That's the tits right there. I did the, undid the hose top of the neck. It should go good now. 
Yep, quite a difference. Kind of makes a guy want to go to the bathroom. Son of a, why did I even say that? We'll have to go to a uh, short intermission soon. Uh, yeah. Oh, I don't know if you want to see much more of this, but I'll turn it off and we'll do the other side after. And I'll show you one side holds some, but it doesn't drain the other. It's going to be shaky, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to turn it on. The other side's drained. And we have full flow. Yeah, it's amazing. See, it's full flow, yet the other side's empty. Just to show you, drain both. Now we should be able to access the front. Take the old pin out. And it should hinge down. There, now we have full access. And yeah, I can't believe that worked. Well, so yesterday while you guys were sleeping, I was making these little plates and I just drilled them and then tapped national pipe thread three eighths in. Then I shoved the fitting that goes to JIC number six. And the reason I like JIC is they're like a wedge, so you never need Teflon tape. It's a swivel, so I can undo these elbows whenever I want. This is actually a hydraulic fitting, and I just cut the crimp off so I can just use the barb for normal 3 8 holes. Um, another thing I was going to mention is the small brother, the small block Chevy, sometimes will leak oil out of these holes. Um, I'm sure some of you have seen it, some haven't, but yes, they do. So I always put a short 3 8 bolt in with a little copper washer to seal it on here and use thread sealant. Why not? So a few years ago, I spent like, I think it's 150 bucks or more on dipsticks. And you know, that was the best damn thing I ever did because it's always something you oversee, you forget, and you bust it off. That or the machine is busted off. They're dirt cheap. And my God, is it nice to have them. Anyway, thought I'd share that with you. The other thing is I bought a huge bag of grommets at the same time for valve covers. Wouldn't believe how handy that is either. So our good old tank is ready to go. I put a valve, this is where it holds on, JIC in, so I got like a six foot hose. I put a valve on there just to make it behave and listen like a good obedient dog. Um, there's the pressure bullshit that you've seen. I didn't have a bung here that size, I forgot one. So I used a one, and a half bunk. So anyway, this will be the fill. So now I'll rinse the shit out of it with gas and stuff for a while and then we'll put oil in. I took the oil pressure line out, put that hose in. So we'll blow oil in it right away and then you can see how that works. Over. Okay, so I put five liters in yesterday. So I'm gonna dump in a liter and a half should hold seven but i don't like ever putting seven in because just because not now do it later i'll bung her up bung julio and i'm not gonna tighten the shit out of that we're not putting seven million pounds on it I think that's about wonderful. So now all I have to do is bring the air hose. Here, boy. Oh, there you are. Good boy. So now I plug it in. Oh, 
Going to close this valve. So I got it set at about 25-ish right now. My bung is leaking a little. So I could probably go to 40. Now, one thing I didn't do is bleed the hose. So I'm gonna grab a wrench for a sec, let's do that. It's a hose I had laying around, so I usually clean them, but you never know. We'll just blow some shit through it. So. Wow. If you guys aren't dizzy, you should be. I'm trying to do both things. I'm gonna crack the valve slowly. There it goes. So I'm gonna shut it off. Otherwise, I would have put air back in the motor. Okay, I'm hooked back up. I'm at 40 pounds. Hose is on. I'm tilting the jug forward a bit, opening the valve. It is now pushing oil into the motor. Everything should be wonderful. I'm going to stop it because it's probably close to done. I don't want to push air in it. Charge the air off tank. Now I can open the lid safely without dying. Uh, I'm going to take the hose off. Then hook the thing back up. And we're going to switch to gas. And lay fire to this SOB. So getting ready to rig up the carb. So I have a JIC, which is on the end of my hose. To a Milton air coupling, which are awesome hose barbs. In case you didn't know. And guy always has them. Two little clamps that came with my little inline filter, which I installed. Sticking forward proudly like a peacock or something pointy. Here's the rig, she's ready to go. I gotta fill her with fuel. I'm gonna install the hose and then we'll get at her. Okay, everything's hooked up. Here's the big conversion hydraulic hose to gas. Yes, under normal conditions, that would be a half inch, but this motor has no load. It's just gonna run. Doesn't have to do anything crazy. It doesn't have to pull anything, so it's more than adequate. So, yes, I know it should be a bigger line. Um, gonna do this. You'll see the little windows. On the quick fuel or empty, this carb's a 750. It's way too small for this girl. I'd like to see a 950 on there. It is a 4150 flange, which I like. It's going to give it street manners a little more versus the Dominator flange. The Dominator's greater on the track, but I want this to be both. Um, I don't know if I showed you the specs, but we'll go over that just before we fire. I'm going to hook the gas up to this and try and set the pressure fairly low. Okay, this is going to be shitty again in just a sec. Okay, so I got the air hooked up and I just turned the regulator right down. So now I'm going to crank it slowly. It's right there. Hear it. So that mark is ten. So I'm at about four ish. Give it a bit more. My bung is leaking. Can you guys smell it? <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna crack this valve and we should be able to see fuel come up. There it goes. Oh, got a little leak. It's 
fuel bowls. One is full and yep, both are full. Okay, looks like I got to deal with that. Great. I'll be right back with more real people. Just got rid of the Lego clamp and I put an other clamp on. It's uh, it's attractive yet functional. It's ugly as shit. Who cares? Okay, I'm gonna turn the valve on. <clears throat> Fuel engaged. Up to the window, up to the window. Should be good. So now the PVC is hooked up. Uh, the vacuum advance is hooked up. I'd normally put a normal distributor and lock that out. But this is my run distributor. Good old HEI. JB sells these things once in a blue moon for 80 bucks. How the hell can you go wrong? I hooked oil pressure line back up. That would have been a big mess. So we should be ready to fire, which we're gonna do right away. So here's the boring stuff. It's a block, it's 1996, which means it's a Gen 5 with a one piece rear seal, no fuel pump um, block, bolt on thing. Uh, I like them, it's a four bolt. The crank is crank, but polished and balanced. I cut it to 10. Uh, main bearings, blah, blah, blah. The GM rods are thumb rods. I showed you that in the videos. They're also at 10. Uh, those are bearings. I like to keep all this in case it comes back for who knows what. I know what's in it. Pistons are Hyper Utech to Keith Blacks. It's 60 over, which is what makes it a 468. Um, they are about 10 and a half to one true compression right now with these cylinder heads. Um, the ring gap is where I said it, you bore times 0 0.065. Uh, second ring gap's always a little tighter, should be. Those are the heads. They're big heads. These are ported. They're awesome heads. Um, uh, they're used. It's the only thing that's really used on another knee intake. Uh, those are set up like just um, valve sizes, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Comps, shafts, a solid roller, uh, 660 and a devilish 666 with duration at 254, 260. Uh, I set the valves a little tighter than what they want for lash because it was cold. So once it warms up, I'll set them again. Uh, the camshaft is fairly stout. It should be good, but should still be streetable. Um, the push rods I used were Howard's. I used them out of my 732,000 collection up there. They're comp cam uh, roller rocker lifters. And uh, the lifters themselves are roller, they're comp cams as well. I think I've seen this somewhere. I know I'm getting lost, too excited. Can't even blink right now. That's how excited I am to fire it up. New baby being born right away. Anyway, timing chain, blah, blah, blah. Got you out of, uh, let's go. I probably should hook up the charger because we're probably going to get a dead battery. But... We'll see what happens first. So this is my dash panel live. Ta-da, pretty fancy. I'm gonna root it around away from the header. Oh, our little dash should come alive now. Um, let's see, ignition. Oh yeah, and the sex lights in there are on. Everyone's home. I'll turn that off. Those are the fans. So now I'm gonna turn on the water pump. And push water to the whole block. 
once it comes full bore out of this top hose, we should be good. I hear her sucking like I want the never mind. Battery's dying on the phone, great. You can see air is starting to work out. seems to be dry so far I don't know about that one it threaded in fairly deep it felt weird but it's not stripped it's just like cheap shit fittings probably the gauges aren't you know your top of the line anything holy a five minute video on adding water I'm just going to shut it off till it gets water. There, we're now getting full flow as you can tell. So we're ready. Okay. Ignition on. I'm going to give it a couple of pumps. And I'm going to hit start. Well, shit blew out couple more pumps I might have to hand pedal it maybe I have to set you down sorry okay. I'm gonna grab a flat screwdriver because chances are I'll have to set something's gonna fire up I wish I had a helper that could carry the foam but the some bitch fired right away which is awesome I'm gonna grab a screwdriver hopefully get it to idle and do its thing quick then I'll take you for a tour So I have no idea the starter stuck. It's weird because it's been in the barn forever, the starter. Uh, hopefully it'll work. I put the charger on. I'll try and fire it again. And hopefully nothing happens and it'll stay running for a little.
Well, that was great. I'm gonna set the timing and shit tomorrow, play with it. I'll let you, I'll update you after on how it tunes. There's a couple little issues. That little cork stupid gasket below the intake. Shouldn't have done it, but I thought, why well, go with that silicone? Bad idea. Uh, same as the front one. Stupid thing. So, there is a little header leak there. You can tell, you can hear it when you're on that side. Flick, flick, that side. The right side is the worst. And when you let off, it actually causes a backfire, which normally it wouldn't do. It would just be boom. But we'll dial all that in. Maybe I'll bang the shit out of these headers a little more. I'd open the door, I'm getting really high. Whew, they won't be able to sleep. So yeah, we'll see you next week. Um, I'm probably gonna start the Duramaxis and we're gonna dig out Duke and get started on that because time is wasting and seeding is coming. So we'll have to pull the motor out of him and I wanna go through the motor and yeah. Anyway, I won't bore you with that. Have a great night, hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think. Later, Mater.